in the last few episodes, we've been looking at um, the causes for Richard's fall and Henry's rise. For this episode, let's talk about um, the Wheel of Fortune and the Fall of Kings. What's interesting is how Richard transforms himself from a king to a wandering religious hermit or pilgrim. There's almost a religious resignation towards the end that, that God will not come with an army of natural forces, but will humble Richard's pride in ways similar to Job. Richard likewise recognizes that falling is part of the cycle of kings. And you notice this not only in his famous speech we looked at earlier about telling, remember what happens on the beach when he talks about the sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed like himself, some slain in war like Richard III, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, uh, that could be Richard III as well, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping, killed, that's Hamlet, all murdered. But we also notice the Wheel of Fortune and the fall of kings, right? It's a long literary tradition. It's called the De Cassibus Virorum Illustrium tradition. In other words, Richard can visualize from a storytelling tradition his own fall and Henry's own rise as part of fortune's wheel. And it occurs when Northumberland is calling on Richard to come down from the battlements and to speak to Henry in the base court the, or the outer courtyard of the castle. Northumberland. My lord, in the base court he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down. Richard. Down? Down I come, like glistering Viathan, wanting the manage of unruly jades. In the base court? Base court where kings grow base, to come at traitors calls and do them grace. In the base court? Come down, down court, down king, for night owls shriek where mounting larks should sing. Richard's language is, again, filled with figures. Northumberland is down below in the base court, looking up to Richard and asking him to come down. So on the Elizabethan stage, Northumberland would be on the stage, and Richard would be in that first balcony. And so Richard uh, is called down, and notice that Northumberland's down, may it please you to come down, is picked up by Richard. Down, down, I come. That down from Northumberland at the end of the line to Richard's down at the beginning of the line, that's anadiplosis. And then the down, down, which adds a certain um, inevitability of the wheel turning, that, of course, is epizeusis. So may it come you to come May it please you to come down, down, down I come, like glistering faith. And, and remember, that's the son of the sun god, right? Who took his horses and lost control and then crashed. Who was wanting the manage. He couldn't control the unruly jades, these overworked horses. And when he says, in the base court, in the base court, base court, again, that's Epizeusis, repeating the down, down, where kings grow base, to come at traitors' calls and do them grace. Fortune's wheel will reappear when uh, Richard is deposed and Henry takes the crown in the next act. Enter York, York. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from plume-plucked Richard, who with willing soul adopts thee heir, and his high scepter yields to the possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry of that name the fourth. To which Balmbrook replies, in God's name I'll ascend the throne. And that's a decision at that point. Richard is falling down, 
and Balmbrook is rising up. But we also see in the deposition that follows afterwards the Wheel of Fortune, in this case represented as a well. Richard, give me the crown to Bolingbroke. Here, cousin, seize the crown. Here, cousin, on this side my hand, on that side thine, now is the golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down and seen in full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs whilst you mount up on high. But where is the scene that Henry explicitly switches from his claims of being the Duke of of Lancaster to becoming the King of England. It's not in the deposition scene. The deposition scene is a ceremonial scene. That scene's almost an afterthought. That's when they bring Richard into Parliament. He's at that point willingly given up his crown. The scene we're looking for is very ambiguous. It happens back down into the courtyard. Henry bows down to Richard, convincing himself he's still there only for his rights. Or, or is that true? He first tells his rough men, eager to depose this terrible king, to make room for Richard. Bolingbroke, stand all apart and show fair duty to his majesty, he kneels. My gracious lord, Richard, fair cousin, you debase your princely knee to make the base earth proud with kissing it. Richard isn't having it. He doesn't believe in this subjugation, right? That's why he's chiding Henry. He has an army, and he's pretending he's doing homage to his king when in fact he's just, quote, debasing himself, lowering himself, degrading his own honor and show. In other words, Mowbray may be correct. And then we get Fortune's Wheel. Up, cousin, up, raising Bolingbroke. Your heart is up, I know. Thus high, at least, indicating his crown, although your knee be low. Is he lying to himself? Is he deluded? Is he ashamed? Why does Richard know? In fact, it's Richard who makes Henry decide. It, you, you, I hope you've noticed when you read the play, and I wish we were in our classroom, we would have more time, I think, to develop this idea. Um, Richard uses the image of Pontius Pilate in Christ when he deposes himself. And you find that in, uh, in uh, 4.1 lines 230 to 35. That somehow Pontius Pilate seems to be following Jesus' lead, right? Resulting in the crucifixion. So watch how Richard leads Henry to his actual desires, right? Henry is Jesus' unknowing man, right? You know, they who know not what they do, right? But Richard knows. Richard, to Bolingbroke. Cousin, I am too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give, and willing to. For do we must what force will have us do. Sit on towards London, cousin? Is it so? Bolingbroke. Yea, my good lord, Richard. Then I must not say no. That's the moment. Henry doesn't know what is happening. But the moment he says yes, he's king. Look, I've read this play a hundred times. And the reason why it's one of my favorite plays is the moment where Henry Bolingbroke becomes Henry IV was always obscure to me. I'd reread and reread and reread this play. And finally, when I had the opportunity to teach it, I read it even closer and closer, right? It's a, it's a very ambiguous moment. And, and it's curious. I wish we could show you different ways actors play this scene out. If we were in our normal classroom and not in the plague classroom, of the internet, of YouTube, I would show you clips. But maybe that's worth looking at different versions of, of Richard 
the second. There are multiple versions out there, and, and directors have had to deal with this problem. And so have printers. The early books reveal as well a curious response to this deposition, and the deposition occurs in the courtyard, not in front of Parliament. And the next episode, we'll be looking at that. All right, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.